Uh, brilliant. Well, hello, everyone. Um, yes, as David said, I lead the Tony Blair Institute's work on digital governance and rights, specifically around platform regulation, democracy, that kind of stuff. And I'm very excited to be here with Julie, two Australians on an, the eve of an election, to talk about um, something that is like very of interest to me, online safety and the track record our country has on doing some pretty incredible work. Um, before I begin, though, I think something that Canada and Australia share is a um, long history of Indigenous culture. Australia has the longest continuous surviving culture in the world. And specifically around online safety, um, these issues impact those communities the most. And so before I begin, as traditional in our country, uh, I want to like acknowledge like traditional owners of the lands that we work on back home, although I don't work there anymore. And I come from the <laughs> land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Yeah, and likewise. And so that should um, set the stage for a very interesting conversation. But um, yeah, I guess like the first question I had for you is, there's a lot of regulation coming to the fray now around online safety, particularly in the UK and the EU. And I know that um, across the Atlantic, there's also murmurs of the same thing happening. Australia has done this for a really long time. So I'd love to hear a bit about your experience doing that. And if there's like a specific angle or approach that Australia has that's unique, that could be lessons learned from. I um, spent 22 years in the technology industry working at Microsoft. Twitter and Adobe, um, often people call, refer to me as the poacher turned gamekeeper because now I regulate the companies. Um, and I, I, you know, I was an abject failure in terms of um, being that safety antagonist inside the company and getting them to do the right thing. So I brought the uh, concept of safety by design to Microsoft 10 years ago and I kind of got the Oh no, Julie, you know, we're we're becoming an enterprise company. We're not gonna, you know, own a social media company, LinkedIn. Um, and um, <laughs> you know, how does you know fixing personal harms really help the bottom line? And I just thought, wow, we really need some cultural change here. I've had a great career here, I'm done. And then I went to Twitter and um I won't I won't talk to you about what I saw every single day. But I will say that I join Twitter, and I think most of us joined the tech sector because we believed in the power of technology for doing good. And that's why we were there. Um, and when you can see that it's being weaponized and misused, or that your leadership isn't taking safety seriously, it's incredibly demoralizing and it's very hard to defend. And what I saw joining this company that was meant to help um, serve as a great leveler and a democratizer and speak truth to power is that you can promote voices, but if you don't protect them, then you're actually leading to the suppression of voices, particularly vulnerable voices. And so, of course, we know that those who are indigenous or Torres Strait Islander uh, who identify as LGBTQI, who have disabilities, are three times more likely to experience targeted online abuse rooted in misogyny, racism, homophobia, harassment, you name the list of horribles. We all know they manifest online. There's the disinhibition effect. And frankly, people have been able to do it with um, in relative impunity, I think until now. I think we're really reaching a tipping point. So that was a long way of saying I am Australia's e-safety commissioner. Um, and we were set up in 2015 as the children's e-safety commissioner. And the story is a little bit interesting. There was Australia's next top model, a, uh, a personality named Charlotte Dawson was very open about some of her mental health issues. She spent a lot of time on Twitter. She probably didn't engage in a way that was very self-protective. Um, and she had a nervous breakdown. She came back. She came back on Twitter, and people were telling her to, you know, take her own life, almost incitement to suicide. And tragically, she did. So while I was interviewing at Twitter to run their trust and safety, um, public policy and philanthropy, um, it was referred to as the Twitter suicide. It also spurred a petition to the government where people said enough is enough, government needs to get involved. But what the government of the time decided to do and the ICT minister at the time was Malcolm Turnbull, who was a technology entrepreneur and eventually became our prime minister, was to start with the most vulnerable. We, we had a kernel, we had an online content scheme that dealt with child sexual abuse material and pro-terrorist content. 
because we have such laws um, and have had them in place for 20 years, 99.97% of the illegal and harmful content we're dealing with is domiciled overseas. So um, we're the hotline like NetMEC or IWF or the C3P um, for Australia. I mean, we're one of the few that sit within a government agency with regulatory powers behind them. But we also set up the world's first and still only youth cyberbullying scheme. And so the way that works is if a child is being seriously cyberbullied, which is defined as threatening, harassing, intimidating, or humiliating, um, and we know, of course, that cyberbullying is insidious because it doesn't stop at the school gate. It does tend to be peer to peer, but it follows the child into their home. It's invasive and it's pervasive. It's very visible to a child and their friends, but very hidden to adults. Um, and so the idea is if they report to the platform and that isn't taken down because that is fundamentally their responsibility, it's also the most expeditious way to get that harmful content taken down. Um, and we want that taken down quickly. If that doesn't happen, they can come to us or a parent or an educator. Um, every time somebody reports to us at esafety.gov.au, it triggers a regulatory investigation. We have a legislative threshold. We work cooperatively with the companies. We have a 90% compliance rate in terms of getting serious cyberbullying content taken down. We also have powers um, to find perpetrators or platforms um, or to issue removal notices and a range of remedial powers. So this is just a way of saying we started small and narrow and with the most vulnerable, and then we added um, regulatory schemes. So um, then I was given, I was asked to set up the revenge porn scheme. And I said, no, I'm not going to call it revenge porn. That's inherently victim, victim blaming. Let's call it what it is, image-based abuse. Um, so we set that up for all Australians, and uh, we have an 85% success rate in terms of getting intimate images and videos taken down from thousands of websites and platforms and image boards all over the world. With uh, the Christchurch atrocity, we were given very potent powers around um, preventing the live streaming of terrorist activities, torture, murder, uh, child rape, um, and even the ability to um, compel the ISPs to block websites in the event of a crisis event. We have never used those um, powers, and I think that's a really important thing. Um, you need to use fairness, proportionality, discretion, and how you use the powers. And while I have punitive powers, um, my primary consideration is providing um, harms alleviation services. And being, um, we know that people, when they come to us, are distressed. So we try and get the content taken down and we'll use what powers we have for the situation, but we'll also put them in touch with mental health services, we'll adjudicate um, some conflicts and the like. So we've got seven years of rich data in terms of how platforms have been weaponized. We see the trends as they're happening, you know, around, um, uh, I think it was Easter 2020, we saw a 600% increase in sexual extortion reports that came into our um, office, um, which came into IBA, and then identified four different sexual extortion scams that were happening at once. Plus, it, we were locked down and digital intimacy tools were being used, um, and uh, that went wrong. So um, in, in any case, um, we've got this data. So we, we know where, how the trends are happening. We also know what the systemic and process failures are. So we've been given a very broad set of powers that have just come into place in January, where we're taking a systems and process approach, very much like the EU and the UK are doing in terms of really targeting those systemic failures, whether it's, you know, failing to identify the mass creation of fake imposter accounts, whether it's um, lifting the hood and asking these companies, what are they actually doing to detect signals when cross-platform volumetric attacks are happening and you know, attacking an indigenous uh, woman in particular, or um, how they're pre preventing the re recidivism of bad actors onto their platforms. You know, we have to surface this stuff because we're getting too much PR spin. Uh, we can name and shame and we've got a cascading set of powers and then we've got some industry codes that are mandatory around proactive detection and removal of what we call class one content. So we're seeing a convergence with the approach that the, the UK and the EU is taking. The last thing I'll say here is I don't think we're going to regulate our way out of online harms. And so these protective services um, are bolstered by prevention on the front end. So we've done a tremendous amount of research 
into measuring behavioral change over time. And we are seeing change with young people, for instance, um, engaging in he, um, help seeking behaviors, utilizing conversation controls and technologies, but then in also developing specialized programs like for women who are experiencing uh, domestic and family violence. In those cases, technology facilitated abuse is almost ubiquitous. So microtransactions in child custody payments happening over banking services or um, multiple harassing messages, drones flying over safe houses and cars stalling when a woman leaves more than two miles beyond the perimeter of her home. So all these things are happening now. We're trying to train frontline service workers to identify and be able to help women. Um, and, um, and their families. Um, and then on the front end, we're trying to do what, what, what I call proactive and systemic change. Um, what does the threat surface look like for the future and how do we minimize it? We've got to put the responsibility back on the platforms themselves. And this is where safety by design comes in as a regulator. And it, it, so we sat down with 180 different organizations, including most of the major companies to say, what are, the, what are the key principles and the, and the actions under it that are going to be meaningful, actionable, and achievable? Three pillars, service provider responsibility, user autonomy, um, what? Oh, user empowerment and autonomy, and then transparency and accountability. Um, but we're all experiencing a bit of principles fatigue, I think. Um, there are lots of principles out there and principles are only useful if they're implemented. So we needed to see tangible actions So we went this step further and we've built, uh, we've built some free interactive risk assessment tools for companies to use. We've had um, both one for startups and one for um, enterprises um, and they've been downloaded in 45 countries, but we're still not seeing that tangible action. What we're hoping is to lift the safety standards and help surface up in, um, industry best practice and then stay ahead of technology trends. And we can talk about the metaverse and that um, DeFi world and uh, how we probably need to learn the lessons of today to try and shape the future tomorrow. Um, thanks for that. It was a very broad overview of the Australian regulatory scheme. A broad, broad. Um, I'm interested in asking, I guess like two questions around, um, I know that there's like maybe murmurings of like a Canadian online safety thing coming out. The UK is in second reading or something like that. I'm looking at the Ofcom guy. Um, and so that's about to come out. And obviously the DSA is a thing. Um, if you had to pick something that the Australian online safety regulatory approach um, was better than the other geographies, and that Canada might be able to learn from, and one thing that they have done that we haven't, um, that uh, uh, the Canadians could also learn from, what would that be? Sure, well, I feel like we've been riding in a bit of a peloton and we've been going up Mount Fantu, um, that the long hill, um, long steep climb kind of on our own, lots of drag, lots of resistance um, without people helping us draft, and so, we're excited, the Irish will probably come on board next. Um, it was interesting being up in Ottawa this week because they are talking about building a digital safety com commissioner. And what I didn't really realize, I often lament that you know, the, the organization that I'm at, um, I, it started with 35 people and you know this kernel, and we've grown it into about 200 people and something that's very different. But because we started slowly and built trust with the public and government over time, we're not facing that same kind of onslaught that Canada is facing um, with this whole idea of, you know, if you have an online harms regulator, it's going to cre you know, create um, freedom of speech issues. And I said, well, yeah, there's a difference between freedom of speech and a free for all. And the reason we have complaints based schemes and legislative thresholds is to make clear, I have to prove when uh, somebody reports serious adult cyber abuse to me, that there was intent to seriously harm and that it was menacing, harassing and offensive in all cases. That's a really high bar. Um, so really the content that we're tackling is higher than most of the thresholds of, of most of the, the platforms and is really getting that content that veers in, in, into the area of serious online abuse. And like I said, you, you can't have a free for all, um, otherwise you'll be suppressing speech. So I'd say that the individual complaint schemes 
um, are something that I think are important because we bridge that inherent power balance that exists between um, the, the everyday person and the tech behemoth. Um, so that's valuable. It, the, the insights and intelligence that gives us is valuable. Um, I know um, that the, the, some of the other countries are gonna come up with a lot bigger penalties and so they'll make a bigger impact potentially over time. Um, we're ramping those up, I think, a little bit more um, judiciously and slowly. Um, but we'll look forward to working with these companies because we'll have powers and abilities that they won't. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at Fred here because, um, you know, I, I, I think there'll be some really important pincher moves that we'll be able to make. And every law is going to have to fit its local, local context. And I'm sure you still have a ways to go. There's, there's a lot in the UK bill, for example, except the kitchen sink. Um, and, and, and so there's gonna be a lot of deliberation. And so the, the, current, the current legislation may not look like um, the final. Um, I'm gonna switch tracks for a little bit. And um, I'm really interested in like, regulatory collaboration um, outside of the Western sphere. And I know that the Australian eSafety Office um, do a bunch of collaborative work um, in the Pacific. Uh, and so I guess like my question is, like over COVID, we saw a bunch of content takedown laws being passed in like less democratic states. And so like, do you fear that, like, what's your opinion on like regulatory export from Western countries and how these kinds of laws could be co-opted by other countries and like what is like the responsibility that that entails from a collaborative approach that like the, the five eyes uh, um, should do more in. I think it's a really important question. It's also a really tricky one and I don't have Yuping's uh, diplomatic skills. Um, but it, you know, it, you, there are a lot of countries out there that do call themselves democracies, but they'll take a much more blunt force approach um, and their political speech or their free speeches yeah, may not may involve political speech. I mean, one thing I can say about our thresholds is that it, you know, it 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 doesn't cover political speech, and obviously we're seeing that happening in Texas. So I don't know if you consider that a foreign country or not. Oh, it's but um, uh, uh, it. It, it's certainly taking um, a different approach, and we hope that that doesn't go go viral. Um, I, I, we have to we we do have to explain um, that we also have um, transparency mechanisms. Uh, you know, I have the responsibility to um, report extensively on the types of um, you know investigations we're taking on board. We've done about eighty thousand regulatory investigations. Um, over the, the course of um, e-safety. Um, if somebody doesn't um, like a decision, I've never had a decision or a, of removing content challenged, but we have systems in place. We have an internal review process. We have a Freedom of Information um, Act. We have a tribunal. We have an ombudsman and, and somebody can take us to the federal court. And I think that's good. Um, so I do think there needs to be scrutiny when people talk about taking down uh, content. And, you know, having worked for Twitter and set up, um, interestingly, when I started at Twitter, uh, the largest, the fourth largest country in terms of users was Indonesia, and we didn't have a presence. So I spent almost a year engaging with um, Cominfo and the Indonesian government to try and navigate what that was going to look like. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted to send us a blacklist of hundreds and hundreds of, um, you know, um, <laughs> sites uh, that they didn't want shown, and that's not how Twitter does things. Um, so it's tricky, and I'm also sympathetic to the companies because we, we don't want a regulatory splinter net of different regulatory requirements. That's going to be hard. So one of the things that we're talking to the UK and others about is how we build a regulatory network of online safety regulators, very much like the, digital, uh, the DPAs have with the Global Assembly. Um, and right now, um, you know, we're also trying to do some capacity building uh, with Fiji. In fact, we're going there next week to help build. They've got an online safety commissioner. We've signed an MOU with the Koreans around digital sex crimes. So we're looking at where we can collaborate in ways that make sense and have synergies. Awesome. And um, I think last question from me um, to end on a bit more of a, a future looking note is like, what do you, what do you think um, a reg 
the approach of a regulator should be around like all this emerging tech stuff around like, yeah, AI generated content and like around metaverse and more immersive realities. Well, I'm, I'm very focused on that because we know that technology will always outpace policy. And, um, you know, the first day I walked into the e-safety office after 22 years in the tech sector, I walked in and I was like, hi, I don't do hierarchy, um, which is, of course, antithetical to, to most government folks. And, and really, I had stunned people. I'm like, so do you have a mission? Do you have a vision? Do you have a song? Is it the safety dance? Um, Anyway, um, I'm getting carried away, but but culturally it was a very different organization. So over time I had to build one that was innovative and nimble. And one of the things that we do is, is we put out tech trends and challenges briefs. So the first one we did was on deep fakes about two years ago, and I couldn't get the mainstream media to even get interested in it. And now you can't t pick up a tech reg and see something about deep fakes. So um, we've done one around end-to-end -end encryption. We try and make sure it's balanced and nuanced. We're talking about the benefits of the technology, but also the risks, and then helping mitigate those risks. We just did um, two last year, one on immersive technologies, where we predicted um, sexual assault by default, <laughs> uh, Nina Jane Patel, um, but also on decentralization. And I think this is a great way to say, if we're not, thinking and understanding how these um, technologies, in fact, in fact, these paradigm shifts um, are going to change and adapt our, our, our regulation accordingly and make sure that we're nimble and, and really think thoughtfully like, you know, do we really want to break the black box? No, I think if we're going to look at future generations of regulating, say, AI, um, we need to use a harms-based, risk-based, and outcomes-based lens rather than thinking that we're going to put a bunch of data scientists and engineers, you know, into all the companies and figure out how their algorithms are tweaking algorithms. Um, but safety by design to me is key. Um, this is putting the responsibility back. It's, it's, it's having companies um, from the leadership, from the top down, prioritize safety, build it in at the front end, and um, you know, now we have the basic online safety expectations, which basically lay out um, the duty of care and what we respect the interactive services to be doing as a right to uh, or a license to operate in our, our country. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Always good to have a perspective from down under. Uh, and yeah, we'll hand it back to David. Thanks.